on World News Tonight. Deadly aftermath. Myanmar and Bangladesh pick up the pieces left behind by the devastating Ceylon Mokha, leaving dozens dead and hundreds homeless. Pushing ahead. Kim Jong-un appears for the first time in weeks to inspect the DPRK's first reconnaissance satellite, prompting global fears. Historic ties. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Canada is ready to partner with South Korea on critical minerals and security, following the historic Yoon Trudeau meeting. And it's the rice season. The King of Thailand and farmers marks the start of the rice growing season with a royal ploughing ceremony dazzling many. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News. Tonight we start off in our northeastern neighbor Myanmar. The death toll in cyclone hit villages of Myanmar's Rakhine state rose to at least 41. Packing winds of up to 195 kilometers per hour, Mocha made landfall downing power pylons, pylons and smashing wooden fishing boats to splinters. Many in Myanmar are feared dead after the powerful cyclone Mocha struck in the region at the weekend. AFP on Tuesday reported that the death toll in cyclone hit villages of Rakhine State has risen to at least 41. The storm had largely passed by late Sunday, carrying winds of up to 195 kilometers per hour, the biggest storm to hit the Bay of Bengal in more than a decade. Sunday's storm ripped roofs off homes and brought a storm surge that inundated the state capital Sitwe. Residents of the western region, too, where there is a large population of Rohingya Muslims, said at least 100 people had died and many more were missing. Yesterday, when the storm came, it blew the roof and walls off of our home. Then we ran for shelter with our children. The wind was so strong that it almost blew people off the ground when they ran. Many people fell over while running for shelter. We have not seen a storm like this before. I stayed home after sending my family to the cyclone shelter. When the storm came, a sudden gust of wind blew the roof off my house. Next, the walls and fences were blown off and again another gust of wind took everything. I was sitting here and could do nothing. Rescuers on Monday evacuated about 1,000 people trapped by seawater 3.6 meters deep along the country's western coast. Myanmar's military information office said the storm had damaged houses and electrical transformers in Sitwe. It also said roofs were torn off buildings on the Coco Islands about 425 kilometers southwest of the country's largest city Yangon. Several injuries were reported in neighboring Bangladesh. A Bangladesh government official said the damage was still being assessed, but that about 2,000 homes had been destroyed, and although no deaths have been reported, around 10,000 others have been injured. French prosecutors have issued an arrest warrant for Lebanon Central Bank Governor Riyad Salameh, who slammed the move to promise to appeal. The warrant followed Salameh's failure to appear before French prosecutors to be questioned on corruption charges. He's been in the sights of French justice since July last year, but it's the first time he's been formally implicated. Riyad Salame, the governor of the Lebanese Central Bank, has been issued an international arrest warrant after refusing to appear before French prosecutors on Tuesday. The 72-year-old denies all allegations and says he will appeal the decision. I will fight against this decision, which is a flagrant violation of the law. Riyad Salameh has been at the head of the Lebanese Central Bank for three decades, during which time officials say he committed an array of financial crimes. The European judicial team behind the probe says Salameh has amassed rich wealth across Europe, including real estate and other banking assets, through a massive embezzlement of Lebanese public funds. The investigation has been hampered by political interference since it was launched last year. Once hailed as the guardian of Lebanon's financial stability, Salameh is now being singled out for being the responsible figure behind Lebanon's financial and economic meltdown, which has plunged more than three-quarters of the country's population of six million into poverty. Now on to news on human rights executions worldwide increased by 53% in 2022 from a year earlier with a significant rise in Iran and Saudi Arabia. Amnesty International said in an annual report that also criticized Indonesia as having one of the highest numbers of new death sentences in Asia. 
In 2022, 20 countries were known to have conducted executions. This is a 53% increase in the last 12 months, the highest number of executions in five years. Amnesty International's report says that the 883 deaths were mostly around the Middle East and North Africa region. We always end up with the same number of states that execute, always about 20. There were 20 in 2022, there were 18 in 2001, but it's always the same ones that we find, essentially in the MENA region, that is to say the Middle East and North Africa. So with the champions like Iran, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Indeed, in authoritarian countries, there is a tendency to use the death penalty as a tool of terror on the population. Executions surged along with the return of trials after the COVID pandemic. And in the Middle Eastern countries, it was due to what the report calls state-sanctioned killing sprees. In Iran, figures rose from 520 executions in 2021 to 825 in 2022, in the wake of widespread crackdown against anti-government activists. In Saudi Arabia, Amnesty noted executions were the highest recorded in 30 years, with 81 people executed in one day. China is the top executor in the world. Though the exact figure is unclear, Amnesty estimates that it lies in the thousands. North Korea and Vietnam also use the death penalty, but official data remains out of reach. But the report also brings a glimmer of hope, as it shows six countries have abolished the death penalty fully or partially. These are Papua New Guinea, Kazakhstan and four African nations. Over in the Far East, North Korea's Kim Jong-un has appeared in public for the first time in a month to inspect the regime's first military reconnaissance satellite. There, he reportedly gave an OK to future plans. Another inspection by the leader himself. According to state media, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Tuesday visited the National Aerospace Development Administration to check the final stage of preparation for its first military reconnaissance satellite. It's been a month since Kim made the on-site visit on April 18th when Pyongyang claimed that its satellite had completed some of the final tests and is ready for launch. Just like last month for Tuesday's on-site inspection, his daughter Kim Jue also accompanied him. North Korea state-run Ro Dong Shin Moon reported on Wednesday that Kim has given specific instructions to the Satellite Preparatory Committee and has given a green light to future plans. The regime's leader also stressed the strategic role of the military satellite, saying it's to exercise the right to national sovereignty and self-defense against escalating military confrontations by the U.S. and South Korea. Kim Jong-un also said the successful launch of the satellite stemmed from the regime's desperate demand for national safety. The Rodong Shin Moon said the project was in a, quote, binding stage, meaning its due completion. Some experts said it's possible the actual launch could take place sometime from May to September, saying North Korea will be cautious over the launch due to the cost of failure. Now over in the war in Ukraine, Russian military officials have said that precision strike by Kinzhal missile had destroyed a U.S.-supplied Patriot defense system in Kyiv. The statement marks the first time that Moscow has reported the destruction of an air defense system supplied to Ukraine by its Western backers. Tonight, the Ukrainian Air Force claiming victory thwarting the biggest Russian missile attack in weeks, downing all 18 Russian missiles fired at the capital of Kyiv on Tuesday, including, the Ukrainian Air Force says, six of Moscow's most advanced conventional weapons, hypersonic Kinzhal missiles. Thanks to the newly deployed Western air defenses, including the U.S.-made Patriot Air Defense Systems. The attacks were carried out as Ukraine's President Zelensky returned from a successful European tour. And tonight, he's rallying more support. Altogether, we are showing what our 100% mean. The fiercest fighting is in what remains of the eastern city of Bakhmut, seen here in a drone feed above what was once city streets. Today, in an unverified video posted on Telegram, Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Russian mercenary Wagner Group fighting there, claimed an American was killed in Bakhmut. The State Department says they're aware of the report, but offered no confirmation. 
Meanwhile, который я себе выбрал. A dramatic public move by the CIA, releasing an emotional recruitment video, seeing an opportunity, offering Russians a secure way to pass information to the agency. People around you may not want to hear the truth, the video says, but we do. Tonight, the Kremlin calling it a convenient resource for tracking applicants. We're going into a short commercial break now. More news on the other side. Welcome back and over in the United States, President Joe Biden and Republican Kevin McCarthy signaled optimism on a debt ceiling deal as a looming fear of an unprecedented debt default prompted Biden to cut short an upcoming Asia trip. Uh, we just finished another good productive meeting with our congressional leadership about a path forward to make sure that America does not default on its debt. President Joe Biden struck an upbeat tone Tuesday following U.S. debt ceiling negotiations with Republicans that ended after less than an hour. But he said there is still more work to do. So I'm confident we're going to continue to make progress uh, toward avoiding default. After meeting with Biden at the White House, Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told reporters the two sides remained far apart on an agreement to lift the debt ceiling. But he also signaled optimism. It is possible to get a deal by the end of the week. It's Democrats were not as positive about a quick time frame, but hoped to strike a deal before June 1st. That's when the U.S. government could default on some debts, according to the Treasury Department. Biden and McCarthy were joined in the Oval Office by Vice President Kamala Harris, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, and Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell. Everything's going well. <laughs> the White House wants to raise the debt ceiling without conditions. Republicans have refused to vote to lift the debt ceiling unless Biden and his fellow Democrats agree to spending cuts in the federal budget. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Everyone agreed that default would be the worst outcome, a horrible situation for America and America's families. But we also agreed that we need to pass a bipartisan bill with bipartisan support in both chambers. I asked Speaker McCarthy, does he agree with that? And he said yes. And his bill, of course, is not a bipartisan bill. Biden said he was disappointed that Republicans will not consider ways to raise revenue. Raising taxes on the wealthy and companies to help pay for programs for other Americans is a key part of Biden's 2024 budget. McCarthy said his party, which controls the House by a thin margin, would only agree to a deal that actually cuts spending. I think anytime somebody wants to raise the debt ceiling more, show me where you want to save more. That's really the framework that we laid out. With little time remaining before the June 1st deadline, Biden said he'll skip stops in Papua New Guinea and Australia after he attends the G7 summit in Japan in order to get back for the final negotiations with congressional leaders. According to a senior UN refugee official, the number of U.S.-bound migrants who cross the dangerous jungle separating Panama and Colombia could rise to a record this year. The number of U.S.-bound migrants who cross the dangerous jungle separating Panama and Colombia could rise to a record this year. In terms of the numbers of people crossing through Darien, have been substantially higher. Um, if that pace was to continue, we would see a record number of people crossing, uh, a crossing from Colombia uh, into Panama um, that are much, much higher than 2022. Kelly Clements is the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees. Her agency has been tracking migrants headed north through the crossing known as the Darien Gap. Government data from Panama show the number of Darien crossings increased six-fold during the first four months of this year. The numbers have tapered recently, but Clements told this week the crises propelling the migration haven't let up. The last couple of days, there has definitely been a slowdown in terms of the number of people crossing. But the reasons that people are moving and the reasons that people have basically picked up their families picked up their lives and tried to rebuild elsewhere have not changed. There are still situations of, of violence, of persecution, um, others that are seeking uh, a better life, and those root causes need to be addressed. The forecast comes after Washington last week rolled out new regulations at the U.S.-Mexico border meant to deter illegal border crossings. 
U.S. officials said Border Patrol agents have seen a 50 percent drop in the number of migrants crossing the border since Thursday, when Biden's administration shifted to sweeping new asylum regulations. But Kenji Kazuka, director for asylum policy at the International Rescue Committee, said the low traffic he saw on the ground in El Paso over the last week was hardly cause for celebration. The plan requires migrants to schedule an immigration appointment through an app or seek protection from countries they passed through on their way to the U.S. border. If they don't and are caught entering the U.S. illegally, they are not allowed to try again, even through legal means, for five years with prison terms for other violations. In a historic move, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau stated that his country is ready to partner with South Korea on critical minerals and clean energy projects and to fend off North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. Addressing South Korea's parliament, Trudeau said that Canada was committed to increase military engagement to mitigate threats to regional security while working together with Seoul to denuclearize North Korea. He said that the issues will be at core of a summit with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol which will be followed by a press conference and official dinner. Trudeau arrived in Seoul in the first visit to nine years by Canadian leader as the two countries seek to boost cooperation on security and critical minerals used in electric vehicles. The two countries, whose relations mark the 60th anniversary this year, are also exploring ways to expand security ties including intelligence sharing while navigating a rivalry between the United States and China. Trudeau said stability in the Indo-Pacific and the North Pacific is essential to global security and urged North Korea to abandon its weapons programs to reopen denuclearization talks. Yoon and Trudeau will sign an agreement on key mineral supply chains, clean energy conversion and energy security cooperation. We have some good news for you. Construction workers are always on alert for potential collapses. Perhaps their working environment could be a bit safer. Now, thanks to a new de development by a South Korean research team, which can detect very small movements in the ground or structures that are common before collapses. Accidents from structural collapses occur every year near roads or on steep mountain slopes. And the risk of accidents increases after winter when ice and snow start to melt. The same goes for construction sites. In order to prevent such accidents, it's important to notice very small changes in advance. Existing ground measurement systems are not utilized much in the field because they are expensive and professional data values need to be calculated numerically. A South Korean research team has developed what they're calling firefly sensors that detect very small ground movements and display them with LED lights. The sensor can be easily attached to the area at risk of collapse with silicon adhesive. It can even detect the slightest movement of 0.03 degrees regardless of the direction. The sensor's LED lights can be seen clearly even in the middle of the day and from up to 100 meters away. Observation data on changes can be transmitted via wireless communication so an immediate response is possible. Malfunctions occur due to vibrations when animals touch and pass by the sensor or where reinforcement work takes place. We developed the sensors with the know-how of the Korea Institute of Civil Engineering and Building Technology. The developed sensor has an ultra-low power design and can be used non-stop for one year without needing to replace the battery. The cost of one unit is as low as 100,000 won or around 74 US dollars. It's applied to slopes where landslides or falling rocks occur and can also be used for temporary structure facilities, earth retaining work and structure dismantling sites. The Firefly sensor is currently being piloted and operated in a section of the GTXA high-speed train route, a chemical plant, a sewage treatment plant and a lava cave on Jeju Island. Researchers plan to improve sensor performance so that it can be used at earthquake sites as well. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A sixth Qatari humanitarian aid plane landed in Port Sudan as assistance continues pouring into the war-ridden country. The plane was loaded with around 35 tons of medical equipment and supplies, including medications, solutions and blood bags.
New Zealand police said that they were treating a deadly hostile fire in the capital Wellington as arson and had opened a homicide inquiry. The blaze broke out on the top floor of the Lofus Lodge in the suburb of Newtown, killing at least six people and causing major structural damage that is hampering recovery efforts. North Carolina Republican lawmakers overrode a veto by the state's Democratic governor to enact a law that cuts the window of most abortions in the southern state from 20 to 12 weeks. The law bans elective abortions after the first trimester, life limiting fetal anomalies and medical emergencies. Ancient textiles, a shrunken head and a funerary bundle are amongst 36 cultural goods recovered by Peru from U.S. countries. 28 ancient textiles, three versicle paintings, a mummy head, a Nazca funerary bundle and a tree Shara shrunken heads are the cultural goods recovered from the United States. Calgary received a special weather alert warning residents of poor air quality and reduced visibility in tinder dry weather and shifting winds elevated the risk of spreading wildfires in the oil producing province of Alberta. Canadian military and firefighters from across Canada and the United States are helping fight the blazes. China launched a geostationary satellite into orbit, making another step towards improving the country's Beidou navigation system. The Beidou satellite was launched atop a long March 3B carrier rocket from the Xinjiang Satellite Launch Center in the southwest. China's Xinjiang province. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we end off tonight with a visit to Thailand, where a crowd adorned in white and yellow shirts gathered at Sanam Luang Grounds in Bangkok to participate in the royal ploughing ceremony, which was attended by King Mahabhadra Longkorn and Queen Suthida. Stay safe and have a good night.